in the Bible of the Christians, clearly stating that the Pharisees, those responsible for the Sanhedrin, were in fact the corruptors of the religion. And unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you're going to go to hell. So if you know anything about Christianity, you know that Jesus is telling them they corrupted it and it's not God's religion anymore. Then when Moses comes to his people, he's telling them that what came before them was also null and void. And he's got what? The commandments. And we would have done the same thing because we're human beings. We would have, except Allah promised in the Quran that he would preserve the Quran till the sun rises from the place that it set. And the Quran has not been corrupted, has not been changed. It's exactly today as it was recited at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'ina sharu la ilaha illallah wa ashara wa muhammadin abduhu rasul ma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. They asked me to talk on the subject today of what's called interfaith dialogue. But those of us that deal with other faith groups, especially in these days, have come to notice a certain amount of shall we say, apprehension, at least on their side, and in some cases, some very aggressive propagation of information that's not necessarily all the truth. So how do you deal with that? I'll give you an example. Somebody says to you, are you a Muslim? You say, yes. How come you're a terrorist? How are you going to ask that? How come you got four wives? How many of you got four wives? How many of you got three wives? Let's put it like this. How many of you even don't have any wives at all? <laughs> you want to get married? Yes. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but how do you deal with that? Somebody come to you and they say this kind of stuff. Somebody will come up to you and say, well, how come you guys have to beat your wives? I'm from Texas. You know, my wife is from Texas. You don't even think about hitting your wife in Texas. She's got a frying pan that big. You know what I'm saying? And she said, you got to go to sleep sometime. There's no way Muslims are doing stuff like this. How? But yet this is the general perception of a lot of people about Islam. They talk to us about killing people, about attacking people, forcing people into Islam. We're hearing a lot, a lot of things that really don't describe Islam at all. So how do we deal with it? What do we say? What do we do? I even had some of the brothers come to me and say, we can't do Dawah these days. I said, why? They said, it's too hard. We're in a situation that didn't happen before. It's not like, you know, we just go out and give somebody a nice pamphlet, a booklet, a business card, tell them about a website, have a nice day. You can't do that anymore. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest about it. If you know anything at all about the message in the messenger, then you know the answer to this question. Did Rasulullah wasalam, have to suffer these same types of aggressive behavior from others? Yeah. Did he have to experience these difficulties or worse? And the answer is yes. Did he and his companions go through the same or similar conditions where people were lying about them? Making stories against them? Yeah. And didn't Allah tell him in the Quran what to do about it? A brother came to me, he became Americanized. You know what it is to become Americanized, right? That's when you come from India to the West and you throw away anything that even remotely looks like Islam, lose the kufi, forget the beard, 
get some t-shirt that says, you know, I love New York, something like this. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And change your name from Muhammad to Mo or Mike. Right? One of the Americanized brothers come to me and said, Brother, this is the worst time to be a Muslim. I said, what? I said, this is the best time to be a Muslim. Don't you talk about, and didn't you hear as you were growing up, people say how I would love to have lived at the time of the Sahabi. You heard that? You heard people say, wouldn't it be nice to live at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be with him, to be close to him, to experience with him, oh, the wonderful days of Islam. You've heard people talk like that, yeah? Yes? Well, that's what you got right in front of you. This is your opportunity. Hello? Right in front of you. It's the best time to be a Muslim. And there is a little bit of effort from your side needed, but certainly you'll be highly rewarded for it. If you will take the time to learn, become educated about real Islam, spend the time with the real scholars, learn Arabic, study the Quran, learn the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, find out the difference between a real hadith and some of these fabrications and weak hadith that people are trying to offer, telling you it's our deen. Spend time with the Muslims, the believers. Build up your own reservoir of patience. And you can do that in Salah. Yeah. Some of you, alhamdulillah, you're praying five times a day. Almost. Close. Yeah? Almost. MashaAllah. Just last week, somebody said he prayed four or five times in one day. MashaAllah. But how about, how about if you pray every day on time in the masjid? How about that? And how about if you make it not just to the end of Juma? You know what I'm saying? You know, end of Juma, right? You got it figured. 117, he'll be through. I can catch the last part of the last rakah. Leave my shoes at the back door. I can be the first one out. Yeah? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I call it the smoker's row in the back. You know, everybody smells like smoke back there. They're out there. Until the last second, when, when they hear the imam is saying, Allahu Akbar, and he's going to ruku, not into takbir al-ihram, no. He's going to the last ruku, and then... A, Go run in and, you know what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah, you're doing salah. But is this the real quality salah? Is this the real way? And you want to complain, oh, Islam difficult. Yeah, you're making it difficult for yourself. Seriously, you're living at the time that the Sahabi would be happy for a chance to go through the opportunities coming to us every day. They would be happy. But they wouldn't do what we do. They would take Islam very serious. They wouldn't consider attending a conference once in a while to be big dawah. They would consider this something necessary. They would consider this something important. But they would also be participating daily in their proper acts of worship. So if you are doing salah, as you should do salah, and you are doing your dhikr and dua, getting up in the night and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're going to see a lot of things change for you. But don't blame anybody but yourself if you're having your difficulties with Islam and presenting Islam to other people. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. So that's the first thing. You want to solve the problem, begin with yourself. I have to do it every day. And so do the brothers who work in this same capacity. We all have to work on this. Secondly, is to have an idea about the other people that you're talking to. Where are they coming from? Some of them are innocent people. They've been lied to. And some of them are the liars that are lying to them. But usually you can tell the difference. 
especially when you begin to answer the questions. And you can see that if you give them the answer, they go, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, really? Tell me more. Okay, that's somebody who really wants to know. But in the case of a liar, he'll just say, oh, yeah, well, what about this question? And you start to give him the answer, yeah, yeah, well, what about this question? Okay, he's one of the liars. In the case of the first one, this is the one Allah is telling you to argue with him in a way that is better. And stay with him and talk to him in a good way. But in the case of the second one, Allah says, فَمَحِلِلْ أَمْهِلْ هُمْ رُوَيْدَ Let them go. They plan. And Allah plans. And the rhetorical question, who's the best of the planners? Let them slag. Don't sit there and argue with them point after point after point. And don't let them tear down your iman. And don't go to the websites. Repeat after me. I, hello, repeat after me. I will not go to any websites except Yusuf Estes website. Amen. There we are. <laughs> Seriously, don't go to their websites because you're raising their status on the internet and you're causing more people to go to them when they do a Google and search on the internet. And Allah will ask you about it. Now that you heard me say it, you're going to be asked. You can't do it anymore. Somebody sends you an email, go check out all these bad websites against Islam. Who do you think originated that email? The guy who made up the websites. Because he knows you'll go click, 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 click on every one of them. One of the most recent ones, talking about a fake Quran. And I'm not going to tell you the name of it because I don't want you to go Google it. If you want to know about it, come to my website and I'll show you what it is. Tell you about it. But it's a big joke. I've seen it. 77 chapters. None of them more than about 14 verses. And the worst kind of Arabic. And they say it's better than the Quran. <laughs> what a yoke. But for sure... They got a lot of presence right now on the internet simply because you have been clicking the wrong links. So be careful about that. Don't support their negativity by giving credibility to it. You follow what I'm saying? When people say something bad, counter it with what? Something good. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Man kana yukminu bila wal yawmul akhir yakhulu khair aw yasmut. He said, let the one who believes in Allah in the last day either say good or be silent. So how is it that you think it's good to talk about things that people are attacking Islam? Is that good? No. But some of us are spending all day long just talking about the negativity. And what is the benefit? You bring your iman down. You bring down the iman of everybody around you. Talk about what? La ilaha illallah. Kalama tayyaba la ilaha illallah. Allah says that in the Quran itself, He bears witness to la ilaha illallah. Allah says it. So why shouldn't we be saying this? None to worship except Allah. Start out with what, when you talk to these people, start out right away telling them about it. Let me give you an example and I'll finish. Inshallah. Somebody comes up to you. You're Muslim? Yes. How come you worship a black box in the desert and you kiss the ground five times a day? Whoa. You ever notice the characters I do all have Texas accents? Yeah. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with the president, by the way. What I just... <laughs> what? What I just want to get across to you is, how do you respond to a guy who comes to you like this? This is very nasty to come to some person and talk like that. Like that. You say back to him, thank you for asking me about my religion. See how I did that? Dr. Zachar Knight style. Go like this. Yeah. Say, thank you for asking me about my religion. Huh? Because they're going to go, what? I wouldn't ask him about his religion. I'm trying to insult the guy, you know. Thank you for asking me about my religion. Islam is based on two things. First, 
the truth. I have to tell you the truth or I can go to hell forever. This is our deen. Ya yuladina amanu ataqallah wa kulu kaulan sidida, Allah says in the Quran. And the second thing is, we have the proof. Every single thing about Islam has been recorded and authenticated and we know what it is. We can't change it. Even if we wanted to, we can't. It is recorded and it's there. The Quran is the same Quran in Morocco as it is in India. It's the same Quran in South Africa as it is in Sweden or Denmark or Norway. It's the same Quran that you find in Texas or Sri Lanka. There's only one Quran and it's always the same. And this goes for the Hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're the same. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us very clear instructions. When somebody asked him, tell us about the deen of Islam, something only you could tell us. And he said to the person, Kul Say, I believe in Allah and be steadfast on what you said. And you can't change this. This is what Islam is about, yes? So we have it. We have the truth and we have the proof. And by the way, sometimes people ask questions that are not really questions. These are statements disguised as questions, but they're statements that aren't necessarily true. I'd like to give you an example. Suppose somebody came to you and said to you, can you answer this question for me, yes or no? You go, okay. Is your mother out of jail yet? Oh, my mother's never been, ah! It's a yes or no question. But she never, yes or no? But my mother never, yes or no, is your mother out of jail? Well, she's not in jail, so I guess she's out, so, yes. Good, I'm glad she got out. You can't win, right? So let them understand that from the beginning, that there are questions that people ask that are not fair because they have statements in them that are not true. And then finally, while I'm answering your question for you, if you hear something, you recognize something in what I'm saying is true and it's good and it's something better than what you have. Are you prepared to reconsider your situation and consider worshiping your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord? Worship Him without partners because you see, that's all Islam is really about, believing in God and doing what He wants you to do. Are you ready for your answer? You see what you just did? You see how you just turned around a very negative situation to something very positive for Islam? Because if he said, yeah, I'm ready for the answer, you're ready to give it to him now. We don't kiss the ground, and we don't worship a black box. In fact, we prostrate to the God who created everything by putting our head on the ground the same way the prophets did, mentioned in the Bible. And we worship the Lord of the universe, and we do it in unification, all facing the same direction. No different even than what the Jews do today, because they always face Jerusalem, yes or no. But Allah ordered the Muslims to turn from that Qibla, from that direction, from Jerusalem to Mecca. And the Muslims did. So that's simple. At this stage, the person would be forced to acknowledge what you're saying is true. And then when he said, well, yeah, that makes sense, then you can say, remember what you said in the beginning? That if you found something that made sense, that was better than what you had, you'd consider worshiping God without partners. You ready to start? Now, at this stage, he may or may not want to know more about Islam or become a Muslim, but at least in the future, he'll think twice before he tries to attack another Muslim. Make sense? Yeah. And that's really all we're supposed to do anyway. Share the message in a very positive and affirmative way. This is Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us success, tawfiq in this, and increase us in our ibadah, and make all of this work for us in the day of judgment. Ameen. Zakum Allah khair. Wassalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Without any further ado, I guess we can go straight into questions and answers. We have arranged here in the studio for your convenience, two microphones, one for the sister section and one here will be for the brother section. When we 
arrange these question and answer sessions, it's necessary that you follow some guidelines so that everything works in a smooth and orderly fashion. We would please ask that those people who have questions form a line at the microphone and that they remain in a queue and do not bunch up around the microphone. We would ask that you state your name and your occupation and then state your question briefly. Do not try to make statements at this time and if you have questions on FIC or any current events that are off of the topic of interfaith dialogue, written questions will always have second priority. Non-Muslims who are here with us today, you are our brothers and sisters in humanity and you can say and ask anything which you like um, and you can make your statements if there was something that you heard and you didn't like it or the way you, it was said you didn't like it and you have a complaint you can come to the microphone and state your question or make your statement or voice your complaint you will always have priority at the microphones either from the sister section or from the brother section if there are any of our Muslim brothers who came with non-Muslim guests I would very much encourage you to encourage them to ask questions at this time because that's what the speakers are here for. You are Muslim brothers and sisters. You're just as much appreciated and your questions are just as much appreciated. But the opportunity for you is a lot more to ask these kind of questions and get these answers. So at this time we'd like to focus on the non-Muslims who are with us. If there are no non-Muslims, however, then we will proceed brothers, then sisters, brothers, then sisters in an orderly fashion. The speaker, uh, one thing, when you're going to ask your question, please uh, begin with your name, your occupation. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Yusuf Vestas. My name is Sayyid Suhail Muhammad, and uh, I am a student and a part-time uh, retailing uh, salesperson. And uh, today morning I had a discussion with uh, a brother here, a non-Muslim brother. He was uh, telling me that uh, all religions, they preach things which are suitable for their time in their place suitable to the environment around them and I said yes this is the case with most of the religions and I was able to say that Islam is an exception to the best of my ability and he, w he did agree to me at last but how would you answer to this question? Bismillah alhamdulillah I think the question was how would you respond to a question if somebody said Islam is like other religions? Yeah. Yes, sir. It's like uh, it is suited to the people and the place there. So Islam is suitable for the people of Arabia. Like he gave me some examples, like they wear like long jubas. Even today, we're wearing according to the Arab culture. Put space between your words because the echo is killing me. Go slow. Yes, sir. Uh, he said that uh, Islam is more suited to the people of Arabia, like uh, Islam ah. is suited to the people of ah. Hinduism. Gotcha. Now I understood what you said. When people tell you that Islam is indicative of a particular place, a time, or a people, then they haven't really understood what Islam is. But I will come back to what I originally said that I thought you said about Islam as a religion like other religions. Or even the question when people ask you, why do you think only your religion is right? Anything pertaining to the subject of religion in general can be found in a beautiful teaching in the Quran, in one of the simplest of old verses in the Quran, Allah says in chapter 3, Al Imran, verse 19. If I get too loud, let me know. Anyway, in verse 19, He said, In Adina, in the Lahir Islam. Now, look, that's short. Any, I can teach this to anybody, even a parrot can learn to say, In Adina, in the lahil islam it means for sure the only deen with allah is islam now the why did i leave the word deen in arabic let me tell you why because i left the other word that it pertains to in arabic the word islam is arabic yes so if you don't know what's islam and you can't explain islam you sure don't need to translate the word deen as religion because if you do, you're making a mistake. Deen itself is a word more, much more inclusive. And I'd like you to consider this. Think about what I'm going to say. Anybody can have a religion or not, right? 
What do you do about somebody who has no religion at all? He doesn't have a religion. He's an atheist. Huh? But Allah uses this same word when he talks about people who are total disbelievers. Kul ya al kafirun. He starts out the chapter of, and it says, say to the disbelievers. And he ends it, lakum dinakum waliyadin. Using that same word again. Now if you're talking to a kafir, somebody doesn't believe anything at all, he doesn't have anything to worship, but you can tell him, lakum dinakum waliyadin then obviously it can't be just religion. Huh? It means your way of life. What it is that you do believe in, whatever it is that you do, what you're made out of, how you operate, that's your deen. Allah says in the same chapter, which is chapter 3, Al-Imran, verse 85, More or less, Allah is saying, that if anybody desires a deen other than the deen of Allah, he will never accept it. And in the hereafter, they're going to be with the losers. Okay, so deen is something special. And Allah is saying that he's not going to accept any deen but his. And then finally, I give him the third reference from uh, al Mayada, chapter 5, verse 3. When Allah says, Al-Yawmul Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum Wa Atmamtu Alaikum Nimati Wa Raditulukum Islama Deen. Hear the word Deen again, you heard it. I'm, I'm emphasizing it so that you understand that when you translate Deen, you need to make it more clear what you're talking about. Just like when you say Islam, you need to be more clear. If you go back and look at those verses I just recited and substitute this meaning for Islam, the submission and surrender to God in peace, on his terms, in sincerity, okay, Islam, and deen, the way of life of a human being, whatever it is that they do, whatever they believe in and how they act, operate, etc., this is their deen, then you watch those verses fall in place, and these guys have to back away. Because if they said, your religion, no, it's not my religion. It's the religion we follow, but it's Allah's religion. He said it's his own. Nipmati, his favor to us. It's his deen. His deen, not even Muhammad's deen. Only in the sense that Muhammad also followed it. All of the prophets followed it. We follow it. Yeah? But we didn't make it up. And that's the difference. The other religions are man-made. And when an atheist says, well, I don't want to follow a man-made religion, I don't blame him. We don't either. In fact, we as Muslims make our scholars prove what they say. They come to us and say, Allah wants you to do this or that. We go, where's your proof? We don't question the person. We're questioning his proof. We want to see where did he get it from. If it's authentic, that's our deen. That is our deen. That's our way. That's God's religion. Authentic has to come from the Quran or for sure verified and authenticated that it came from our prophet who brought the Quran, which is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Make sense? So when you talk to anybody about it, whether it's a general statement or specific, be sure that you let them understand this is not our religion. It is the way that God has ordered for people who want to be successful in the next life. And if you don't want it, have a nice day, baby. Got it? That's it. And it works all the way around, regardless of how they bring it. Thanks for a great question. Zakallah khair. These events are arranged so that you can ask your questions, make your statements, and give us that feedback which we would always appreciate hearing. So if there are any non-Muslims in the audience, I request that you go to the microphones. The uh, volunteers will assist you in getting to the front of the line, and you may state your question. This time we'll go to the gentleman in the front. Please state your name and your occupation, and briefly state your question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammad Shafi. I'm a welding and coating inspector by profession. Well, my question is to uh, Sheikh Yusuf. Today we all know that uh, the Christian missionary is more stronger and uh, effective than the uh, Muslim missionary. So how we could uh, improve ourselves to, uh, to have more uh, volunteers or like uh, the peace organization 
and where we lack in exactly and uh, how we can improve and what's your suggestion and recommendation to the young generation? The question is for Sheikh Yusuf on the fact of the Christian missionaries are stronger or appear stronger to our questioner than the Muslim missionaries. So what do we do to balance the tide and to get the message out for Islam? If I misquoted that or if I paraphrased it no, in the wrong way, you can sorry. restate it. Correct. Bismillah. It's a good question. I don't know if your statement's true or not, but you say if they appear stronger to you, that'd be your, that would be your position, and you're entitled to that. From my perspective, and I've been preaching Christianity a number of years and then preaching Islam a number of years, from my perspective, even the weakest of Muslims is a much stronger preacher of Islam than the strongest of these TV evangelists. And I just got through this morning writing a paper about that. In fact, if you want a copy of it, I want you to send me an email. Send me an email and I'll send you or anybody else who hears this in the future. I will be happy to send you a copy of this because it's very important statements that we have in Islam, particularly on this topic of the missionaries and the born-agains who are trying to insult Islam, attack Islam, and spending all of their time, by the way, lying about Islam, must be they don't have much of a religion of their own to practice. Huh? So for sure, I don't agree with your, your uh, take on it, but you're entitled to that. I happen to know for a fact that they spend millions of dollars and send tons of people and a lot of literature and a lot of lies into many countries. Okay, and this is proven with articles even in the West clearly showing what these guys are doing. And it even shows how unsuccessful they are at getting anybody to convert to their nonsense. To the extent that in the articles they've explained that in one particular country they spent more than $10 million, more than a decade of time, and were only able to influence four families to go to their way, but in the meantime, they caused so many problems, especially in the embassies and the relations between countries, they were asked to leave. Huh? That doesn't sound very powerful to me, does it to you? Yet if you want to go, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, now most of us think everybody in Saudi Arabia is a Muslim, yeah? The majority of the people living in Saudi Arabia are not Muslim. How many of you knew that? Is that right or wrong? That's that guy sitting right there in the white outfit. He's disguised as a Saudi right there. <laughs> Ask him. Is that true? And every day, every day they stand in line like you guys are standing in that queue right there to make their shahada. Yes or no? Yes. They're coming not only to Islam, they're coming to Saudi Arabia to get it. And it's not just there, it's in Bahrain, it's in Qatar, it's in Kuwait. I've been to the centers, I've watched it happen. I stand out like this. And you don't have to be great, you don't have to be a fantastic speaker. All you have to do is say, you don't want to be a Muslim, do you? And they go, Shadu la ilaha illallah, Shadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Because they are there, they're seeing Islam. They're witnessing for themselves the beauty of the deen, even in us. And we're not the best examples of Islam. But even the little bit that we show is better than anything they can brag about in any other religion. You know why? Because we can hear them talk the talk, but they can see us walk the walk. Got it? For me, there is no other way except this deen, this way of Islam. Zakalah here for a good question. Thank you for the question. Okay, are there any other non-Muslims from the female or male side? Hey sister, go ahead and ask your question. I'm a non-Muslim. My name is Shweta, and I'm a student. Uh, sir made a statement saying other religions are man-made. I would like to, I, I would want them to elaborate on it. I didn't quite understand. Did you have a particular speaker who you would like to answer? Well, Sheikh Yusuf will take it, inshallah. Bismillah. I am the one that said it, so I'll be responsible for my own words. Sound fair? Yeah, I said that. All, all religions are man-made except the one which comes from the God. Yes? Yes or no? Because if it didn't come from God, where'd it come from? Human beings. 
And the way to know whether or not it came from God is to put it to the test. Any claims that are made, you should be able to verify them. Any statements, anything, whether practical or impractical, should have some relevance to what we understand as human beings. And if you find within it that it just doesn't fit, it doesn't work, it doesn't make sense, even in a small part or a large part, then obviously you got to say this doesn't work. And how would it be that the God that created everything had a specific religion only for one person or one group of people? What we spoke about earlier when I was talking about a dean, it has to be all-inclusive. If it's really from God, if it's really from the Lord above, if it's really from a creator, if there really is a creator, then he should know what he created. And he should know everything about us as a whole and individually. And we think there's like six billion or so human beings staggering around the earth today, right? Right? Yeah. So he should know every single one of them and what their needs are. And then what he offers for them should be good for everybody and good for each and every one of them at the same time. And in fact, after studying many religions, I found there isn't any such thing. That all of them have their limitations. All of them are going to be indicative to the particular place, time, and person that they came to. Because in fact, they came from that person or that group of people. Now, according to what we have in Islam, we know that there's only been one God since the beginning, and he has sent revelation down to the people. He has sent prophets to the people from the best of the people amongst them. He chose these people and inspired them and showed them how to teach. Then in later generations, people corrupted it. And this is what we find the accusation coming to the Jewish from Jesus himself in the Bible of the Christians. Clearly stating that the Pharisees, those in, responsible for the Sanhedrin, were in fact the corruptors of the religion. And unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you're going to go to hell. That's in uh, Matthew 5, 17, 18, 19. It's very clear. So if you know anything about Christianity, you know that Jesus is telling them they corrupted it and it's not God's religion anymore. Likewise, if you know anything about some of the followers of Jesus, such as James, they claimed that Paul was corrupt. And they said that he was corrupting the religion. In fact, he also was a Pharisee. Then when Moses comes to his people, he's telling them that what came before them was also null and void. And he's got, what, the commandments. And when Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes, he's saying again the same thing, whatever was before, shh, because people have corrupted it. The people of Mecca, at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, are descendants, many of them, from Abraham and Ismail. And they had the real religion right there in their place originally. But they corrupted it to the extent that nobody would recognize it anymore. Except for the fact that they went in the same direction about around the Kaaba, and maybe between Safa and Marwa. Other than that, you wouldn't be able to recognize it. The practices that they had. Emphasize killing little baby girls, burying them in the sand, walking around in their worship naked, drinking alcohol until their brains were cooked. The things that the people did, and they claimed it was part of their religion. So when people have free reign, they will change the religion to fit themselves, and they always do that. And we would have done the same thing because we're human beings. We would have, except Allah promised in the Quran that he would preserve the Qur'an till the sun rises from the place that it's set. And the Qur'an has not been corrupted, has not been changed. It's exactly today as it was recited at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Exactly what he taught then can be taught right now. And it fits, not only in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> it fits in a place called Mecca, Louisiana. It fits in a place in Texas where I grew up, called Houston. It works because it is general and it's specific, but it works because it's really from the God. The message of Islam is a very simple one. It is to believe that there's one God and only one. And all of your love, all of your devotion, all your energy is for him and his deen, his way of life. That's the message of Islam. And whoever wants that can have it.
even if they don't know Arabic. In fact, if there was somebody, like you hear this question posed very often by disbelievers, what if you have a religion, yes? What if a baby is born on a desert island and grows up on a desert island somehow with no influence of any human being? Just grows up out there eating watermelons and coconuts, okay? What does your religion teach you about that baby? Can that baby be in your religion? Without knowing anything about your religion, could he be? In fact, Islam is clearly stated. The baby started out as a Muslim in the deen already. And something will have to take him out of the deen. Otherwise, if he stays in what he was born in, he will die in the right way. Believing there must be something up there, although I don't know what, but if I knew it, I would do the best I can to serve him. If that's their attitude, that's all they could be expected to do. Make sense? Do you understand me? What is this? Yes or no? Cool. Thank you. Assalamu Sister, um, thank you for waiting. Could you please state your name and occupation, then state your question? I'm Sakina D'Souza, and uh, I'm a Catholic. I believe uh, Brother Yusuf was a Catholic before. I would like to ask him the simple question. He was brought up like a Catholic, but what made him change? Doesn't he believe that the Messiah is true? Or did he ever feel that the uh, religion, Catholic religion, has not brought up any Messiah and the Bible is false? I would like to just know what that means. Because he said he was a Catholic before and now he has become a Muslim. What made you change? What was that storyline before? Doesn't he believe that there is a Messiah or the Messiah had come, saved us, died on the cross? Thank you very much for a good question. I hate to disappoint you, but I wasn't a Catholic. But I was with a Catholic priest the night that he accepted Islam. And I asked him these questions you asked me. Because after all, I was still a Christian a preacher in Christianity, and I wanted to know why my best friend, a Catholic priest, had converted. That's a pretty weird thing. A Catholic priest is not like a regular preacher in the Protestant religion. A Catholic priest has given up, his, given up everything. He's given up his life to be a Catholic priest. When he enters into this realm, he's basically given away everything. He can't have a wife, he can't have children, obviously no grandchildren. He has no home. He just lives in a rectory or wherever they give him a place to stay. And he's sent wherever they tell him to go, do whatever he's told to do, and that's it. And he cannot disobey the Pope, otherwise they can kick him out of the religion. And if they do, he's excommunicated and he goes to hell forever. So how would a person like this want to become one of those Muslim terrorists? That's what I wanted to know. He explained in a very few beautiful words something that I came to learn for myself. He said that he was sincerely in the Catholic religion because he believed in God. That he had studied, his degree was in theology, and a part of the teaching that they as priests have is to study Islam. Every priest is forced to study Islam. Now you may not know that, but you can ask your priest and he'll confirm it. And when you study Islam, even when Islam is taught to you by somebody who hates Islam, as long as they don't corrupt it too far, you can still see the truth in Islam. A classical example happened to me just recently when I was in Saudi Arabia. A friend of mine, very old copy of one of the first Qurans ever translated to English by George Sale. George Sale hated Islam, he hated the Muslims, but when he translated the Quran to English, he was true. He was true to the text of the words. Although maybe not getting all the meaning, he certainly was true to the text of the words. I was shocked when I read it. Have you seen it? You know what I'm talking about. Amazing. And listen to this. George Bernard Shaw, for instance, is one of many, a long list of people who read this and realized the truth of Islam. When people see the truth of Islam, it can change them if they want to be guided. If they want the truth, it can change them. 
You might think I'm a Catholic, I'll never be anything but a Catholic. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest. This is not for you to, you know, start a debate, but just be honest. Was Jesus a Catholic? And it's not open to debate, so there's no point in opening that up because you know and I know he wasn't. The Catholic Church was in business about 300 years before Jesus was born. It's on their website. Don't go like this. It's on their website. That's where I took it from. The Catholic Church was really started in Rome by Alexander the Great. Do you know what the word Catholic means? It means universal. It was the universal church for the Roman Empire. If you didn't join it, you could not be a Roman citizen. And it was opposed to the teachings of Judaism and opposed to the teachings of the early Christians for more than 200 and some years. And they were diametrically opposed to each other to the extent that it was the Romans killing the early Christians. Now, if you understand that, and you go to their website and read, they didn't even take over Christianity until the year 325 A.D. And when they did, they changed a lot of things. Again, referring to their own website. But if you want to check it in Brand Britannica or Americana or grow your encyclopedias, go ahead and read about the Catholic Church. When, in August of 325 A.D., at the Nicaea Council, they took over... First thing they said was, let's change the date of the birth of Jesus to be the same date as that of Mithras, which was the god, one of the gods worshipped there, and also the sun god's birthday was the same day, December the 25th, believing it to be the shortest day of the year. And Constantine was a sun worshipper of Saul Invictus. Go to the website, read it for yourself. There are a lot of points, but not the least of which, even today, if you go in any Catholic church, and I have, you'll see so many portraits and statues and idols and images throughout the whole place that for the one who's never experienced that, for a Muslim who knows about these images, he'll be like, whoa, how was it below? Whoa, what's this? The first time I walked in a Catholic church, I was about 10 years old. I was shocked. I was shocked at the idols and statues everywhere because in the Protestant religion, we were brought up to believe that the second commandment was just as important as, as the first commandment. The first commandment in the Bible, in Exodus, is the same as the first commandment in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt in the house of bondage. You know no other God beside me. Beside me there's no other gods. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. How many in this room agree with that commandment? Raise your hand. You notice... The Muslims are raising their hand because it means Ashadu la ilaha illallah. That's the first commandment for us as well. The second commandment you have clearly says, Thou shalt now make any idol, any graven image of anything that creeps upon the earth, swims in the sea beneath, or flies in the air above. And I was sitting in a church one time, sitting there in the morning service, watching, you know, the preacher talk. And you know, they go on and on and on. And sometimes you lose your train of thought. I was looking. Whoa! On the front of the podium, there was a fish. A fish. For the symbol, make you fishers of men. They had a fish. I said, whoa. Then I looked up above his head at the big stained glass window, and it had a dove. And he had the, the olive branch in his mouth. The dove is flying, the bird, you know? I said, whoa. And then I look over here, and there's a cross with a man hanging on it. And I said, wow, they didn't miss a single one. They got them all. Something walking on the earth, something swimming in the sea beneath, something flying in the air above. So look at these two things. Clearly, the first two of the Ten Commandments, bang, bang, boom. Because if you said God is more than one, where did you get it from? When Jesus is talking to his own companions, and they ask him, what's the greatest commandment? Mark 12, 29. Clear. The greatest commandment is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And this is no different from what Prophet Muhammad was saying, the same thing to his people. 
Same thing I mentioned in the lecture. This is certainly for us the same. So what you see is Muslims practicing the commandments and you see people claiming the commandments but practicing something else. And there I have seen more converts from the Catholic Church than any other of the many sects of Christianity and especially from the nuns, priests, and even an archbishop. And all of them are better than me. Those guys and women that I see do this, they still sacrifice their whole life to get the true message of Islam, not only to you, but to Muslims as well, because we all need to know about it. But thanks for a great question. We have a question from the men's section, and then we'll come to the question for, the, for you, inshallah, sister. Be patient with us, please. Assalamu alaikum, brother. It's a question from a Christian brother. He says, um, Christian missionary perform miracles by healing in the stage. Is it true or false? If it is true, how do they do it? Hallelujah, brother! <laughs> For my first miracle today, <laughs> you know, I want to be serious with you about this. Muslims also believe in miracles, very much so. We believe in miracles happening around us every day, without doubt. We consider a human being to be one of the miracles of Almighty Allah. Allah says in the Quran, لَخَرْ خَلَقْنُ الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَانِ تَقْوِيمُ ثُمَّ رَدَّدَنَهُ مَسْفَلَ السَّفْلِينَ It's clear in the Quran that Allah tells us that we're one of the miracles that He created. And He blew life. He blew life into Adam. And he gives every one of us life, and he gives us breath, and he gives us a brain, and he gives us opportunity to know up from down, right from left, and also to know when it's raining and somebody's pouring water on your boots. I had to change that a little bit. But anyhow, yeah, there are a lot of guys that do stuff for show and dough, all right? And remember, I used to know these guys personally. I used to travel with one of them, and I'm going to tell you right now, you don't want to know the things they do after they walk off the stage. And you don't want to know all the people that they pay off to pull all their little tricks. And a lot of people are highly emotional and giving in to this kind of stuff. You see them come in in a wheelchair. Well, I'll tell you what. I came here in a wheelchair myself in the airport. And when I go in airports, many times I use the wheelchair to transport from one side to the other. And when I do tawaf around the Kaaba, I always use the wheelchair. And whenever it's all over with, you can take a camera and show, here's a guy going around the Kaaba, going around, look at that, in a wheelchair, and suddenly I get up and walk out. Hallelujah, a miracle! I forgot to tell you, I could walk when I sat down. <laughs> the other thing they'll do is tell you, somebody has, you know, a tumor or a cancer. That's one of their famous ones that they love to tell you. Somebody's got a tumor or a cancer. Somebody right over in here. Somebody right over here. I, I know you got a pain. Well, all of us got pains. We eat this, if you eat this hot food in India, you're going to have lots of pains. Yeah? And get you up on the stage and you're all like nervous and everything anyway. And you're going to be healed in the name of whoever. And then what? They knock you down to the floor. You get up and you're like, oh, man, I better say I'm okay so they don't hit me again. Yeah, I know about this stuff. And if you want to buy into that, if you consider that a miracle, let me share with you a real miracle. And I want you to think about this. Let's take any 10 people from right here that are all from this city here in Chennai. Any 10. You choose them and line them up here on the stage and then read two paragraphs of some made-up poetry, anything you know that you made up that they never heard before, two paragraphs, and just... Recite it to this one, and then let him whisper it to the next one, and then he'll whisper it to the next one, and the next one till you get down to the number 10. Will it be anything like the original, yes or no? Are you sure? Yeah, you're right. It will not be anything like it. We used to play that game when we were kids. We called it telephone. Do you ever play that game? It's a lot of fun. Now I'm going to ask you. We talked about 10 people all living today in the same place with the same language, with the same dialect, and we only talked about 10. And I'm going to ask you, what are the chances that somebody speaking Arabia, the Arabic language, living 1,400 years ago in the desert could recite 6,000 
237 verses, all in Arabic, and have it exactly memorized and passed down for 30 generations without a single loss of a single word or even a vowel marker or even a dot. It's impossible, except if it came from Allah. And by the way, no matter what I say, doesn't really matter. What matters is what he said. He said. He said he'll protect it. He'll protect that until the sun rises from the place where it sets. Uh, which way did it come up today, guys? In the east? Cool stuff. I think this will be our last question for the day. I'll go to the gentleman in the front. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Kalimur Rahman. I was a professor and now I'm doing business. The question is to uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estate. There are uh, several websites now on Islam, maybe about 200 websites. What is the method to identify which site is not based on deviation? About five years before, there were only hardly a couple of websites. Now about hundreds. I need a small uh, kind of a methodology to identify website which is, which is not based on deviation. And I also have a question on FIC, which I have uh, sent an email to uh, Sheikh, which I'll discuss later. And regarding the heat, Sheikh, uh, I'm sorry, this is Chennai. We have three seasons here, hot, hotter, and hottest, and this is the hot season. Sheikh Mamdou is saying it's not the sun outside, it's these lights in here. We brought our own sun inside with us. Alhamdulillah. Well, first of all, that's a good question because you gave me the opportunity to do what I do best, which is to promote our websites. However, I have to tell you that when I went to the web the first time using CompuServe in the early 1990s, I did a word search. First thing I did, didn't even know what I was doing. They said, this is how you do a word search. First word I typed in was Islam. We had about eight websites in 1993-94. Eight. Eight websites. Now there are more than 58 million websites with the word Islam. According to Google's latest, and you go type it in tonight, it'll be more than that. Okay? 58 million. Now which are the good ones? I don't know. Because I haven't been to all of them yet. Which are the bad ones? That I have seen. I've encouraged you to stay away from the bad ones. Don't promote them. Don't talk about them. Don't even think about them. Because I'm afraid Google will find your brain and somehow put it up there. But I would like to tell you about some websites that we have. We have operating websites today, right now, for us, about 40. 40 right now. Starting with Islam Tomorrow, Islam Yesterday, Watch Islam, Hear Islam, Chat Islam. Islam events, Islam newsroom. Then going and moving on to 911 Bible, Bible Islam, Islam code, Islam domains, if you want to start your own website. But I can't remember all of them either. So we made another website called Links to Islam. And if you just go to this one, you'll find so many of our websites right there and you can spend the rest of your life going through the articles. We have tens of thousands of articles and graphics and links to keep you busy for a long time. How many of you heard about YouTube Islam? Anybody heard about YouTube Islam? Well, guess what? I got that idea when I saw how popular YouTube was. I said, huh, wait a minute, let's put up YouTube Islam. Because I know people will type in in Google, YouTube space Islam, so they don't have to go through all the junk. And of course, that sends them to our website first. So that's some of what you can do with it. If you really want to see how to use these websites effectively, then send me an email and I'll tell you how to put them in order. But just to give you an example, Science Islam, you just spell it like normal, as one word, scienceislam.com is for atheists and people who don't really have a clue what our purpose of life is. 
Second one I usually recommend is GodAllah.com. Again, those are two words people type into Google all the time. I come up number one, God Allah. And it explains the Tawheed of Islam and why Islam is having the right name by saying Allah. The next one we recommend in there is Allah's Quran.com. Again, people will type in Quran, Allah, something like this, and that will come up as the number one site. The next one after that we recommend is Prophet of Islam. Dot com because this one would tell all about Muhammad A to Z. It has a section called Muhammad A to Z in it. Each of these has the latest and best, I think, of the graphics and technology so that if you want to listen to the programs that are there or watch the programs there, it uses the technology of the websites themselves rather than trying to use your real player from your computer. It saves a, a lot of uh, resources in downloading, especially appreciated in Sri Lanka and India in places like Pakistan where the high speed is still slow speed. So I recommend to go to linkstoislam.com and from there you'll be able to see what we got and send me an email at yusuf, Y-U-S-U-F, at 99islam. That's another one I forgot to tell you about. 99islam.com. And let's wrap it up with that. I'll give you the commercials at the end. That's fair. And now I want to make a dua for all of you. Everybody that's sitting right here, I want to make a big dua for you. I want to ask Allah to give guidance to me, to you, to our friends, to everybody. There's only one God, and I'm asking Him to give us all the best of His guidance to the best way for the best end for all of us. Amen. <laughs>